You are accessing the presentation entitled Instructional Design and Disability Compliance. Our learning objectives and topics for this particular session are ableism and hidden discriminations, the role of education, medical service expectations and conditional disability, and introduction to real life practitioners with disabilities. So let's jump right in. What is ableism? Ableism is discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. That can also be said as discrimination against people who are unable to function normally in relation to a majority experience. Ableism can appear in many forms, but the most covert ableism is in our language. For instance, did you notice that I started this slide with, let's jump right in? To be able to jump is an abled idea. Jumping requires the use of our limbs, our lungs, and our vision. Yet for the most part, I'm guessing it's a phrase that just went by in your attention as normal. That is a tiny example of ableism. Here are a few more examples of covert ableism in language. When we say to a student, look at your syllabus for more information, what we really mean is to refer to the syllabus, but to use the verb look presumes sight. On a website, when we create a link that says click here, we are presuming sight as well. How about when we say it's absolutely nuts to wait until the last minute regarding something we find intense or amazing? People who struggle with mental and emotional health may be uncomfortable given the great stigma that comes with the word nuts. Ever heard the phrase, wow, that project idea is lame? What we mean is that we think that thing is unacceptable or unreasonable, but to the person living without the ability to use their limbs, lame has a whole other meaning and impact. You might say, but Mel, that's just our vernacular. It's how we talk, and our students speak that way too. Well, here's the issue. Vernacular is defined as the language or dialect spoken by the ordinary people in a particular country or region. The problem isn't that vernacular exists. The problem is the word ordinary. Vernacular is what ordinary people speak. In other words, the normative people, the people who are the majority and who maintain the privilege of defining normal versus abnormal. Now, I doubt any one of our faculty at Wilson School of Nursing would use such language in our teaching or with our students, but it's worthy to consider covert ableism when it comes to our online courses. After all, how we design our courses and what we expect our students to accomplish in their learning are directly impacted by how accessible information is and how information is accessed. Before we get too engrossed in the how-tos of compliance, though, we need to understand the why. As educators of our next generation of medical professionals, we have a responsibility to our students' future patients. The better trained and more deeply knowledgeable our students are, the better served our future patients will be. The halls of medicine have long held high expectations on the natural abilities of students. If a student has not been able to be successful with the instruction provided, they are simply not cut out to be a provider of health care. When this belief becomes the presumption, we enter into an area of discrimination. That's ableism. Again, ableism is the discrimination in favor of able people and therefore against people with disabilities. However, our science continually reveals new truths about the ability of people once deemed unable or handicapped in some way. To further understand the history of ableism, it would be helpful to understand the word handicap. The word handicap, in reference to a person, appeared at or about 1915 and became widely used in reference to persons with disabilities by the late 1950s. Its direct etymological predecessor had nothing to do at all with people. Instead, it had to do with games, betting, and horses. In fact, excellent horses. Imagine you have bet on a horse race. 
but the two horses racing are significantly different. One is larger and visibly stronger, while the other is smaller and presumably weaker. Which do you think was considered handicapped? Not the weaker. In fact, to handicap a horse was to add an extra burden to the stronger, so as to make the race more equal. A handicap, therefore, was given to the strong so as to not overwhelmingly excel beyond the weak. If you know someone who lives with a difference in abilities, you likely have experienced this sense of an extra burden. You may even have experienced the sense of hope that they can actually excel be in spite of that burden. If you are especially fortunate, you've witnessed that excelling, or you've done it yourself. If someone were to attend a course of undergraduate or graduate study with some level of disability, it would be worth our while to recognize that they have already excelled. What better way to honor their excelling than to ensure that we have done everything we can possibly do to facilitate their continued success? Of course, there are some realities we know about serving in a medical profession that would make it all but impossible for people with some kinds of disabilities to thrive. However, as faculty, you are in the business of educating whomever comes to be educated. What students do with their education is out of our control. Education does not necessitate a profession. Education creates knowledgeable people who, within their own range of ability and desire, may educate and serve others in whatever ways possible. Still, schools of medicine continue to struggle with accepting and empowering students with disabilities. According to the University of Michigan Health System, quote, only a third of medical schools said outright that they would accommodate a student with a disability who otherwise qualified to attend. Another half had vague information about who they would accept. A national study concluded, quote, most medical school technical standards do not support provision of reasonable accommodations for students with disabilities as intended by the ADA. Further study is needed to understand how schools operationalize TSs and barriers to achieving ADA standards. It's also worthy for us to consider that the most striking of disabilities are not usually the ones that faculty of higher education and nursing encounter. The person enduring paraplegia, for instance, would not be able to complete clinicals and therefore could not meet the demands of study in that course. Still, they may be able to complete research, theory, and study in areas that do not require the use of their limbs. Consider the story of these physicians overcoming their disabilities to make a difference for their patients. I have worn hearing aids since I was three years old. For me, I um, haven't known anything but deafness. About five and a half, almost six years ago at this point, I was injured in a slip and fall accident at home. Uh, I slipped and went backwards and my neck landed on the edge of a very thick, hard glass coffee table. And it popped uh, one of the vertebrae in my neck clean out of my spine. At age eight, I went on a trip to Texas and Mexico with my father. The first evening that we were there, uh, when we came back to the home of the people with whom we were staying, I couldn't find the door. So I spent a lot of time not knowing I was legally blind. I think the more people see someone in my role, the more comfortable they'll be with it and understand like, oh yeah, I guess that is possible after all. My parents were both in the medical field, but they could not imagine that with this condition where I would likely become blind later in life, that I would be, be a physician, and frankly, neither could I. I talked to the doctors who were in my rehab, and he told me, you know, absolutely, you still can, you can still be a doctor. And I thought, okay, well, I can be a doctor, I can't be a surgeon. That's what I always wanted to do. Until I talked to a friend's wife who was a surgery resident who said, yeah, you can still, why not? You'll find a way to make it happen. And that's really the first question someone should be asked is not just what can't you do, but what do you do? I love being in this kind of position because there are not enough deaf 
doctors or doctors with disabilities out there. Well, the first thing I tell any of those, any of the people who are interested in pursuing medicine or some other, you know, significant task after having a disability is don't listen to the people who tell you you can't do it. I know working on the wards is challenging, especially using the telephone and trying to present to somebody like who talks really, really fast and doesn't have a whole lot of patience. How do you do medicine when you're blind? Well, you know, you've got computer equipment, you've got a cane to go around, you've got uh, uh, all sorts of technology that's around now. So I think that's very, very important because between technology and personal uh, help, uh, there's an awful lot that can be done uh, by people who have very significant limitations. The interpreters here are very open people and are very easy to connect with. And they're all very wonderful individuals, and I'm very proud to work with them. I remember the first time I went into an operating room as a medical student. It, I was very, I don't want to say apprehensive, but it was, it was a nervous time because it was the first moment I'd be standing at the operating room table using the adaptive wheelchair. And it was just unbelievable. The first case, I didn't really do a whole lot but I remember just the excitement at standing at the table with everybody else, you know, doing what I'd wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Patients didn't and still haven't made a big deal about it at all. Uh, it's perfectly possible for a patient to have absolutely no idea that they can't see anything. I think the big advantage to being, you know, having a disability that's especially one that's visible is that I can use it to connect with patients. Um, you know, they see it and they'll know that I've been in the bed before, I've been through procedures, I can tell them I know what it's like to go through this. There was one patient in my entire time that I've been working here who didn't want to have me treat her. And she didn't say it to me, my secretaries were so mad. I said, oh, we're going to give her the meanest doctor <laughs> in the place <laughs> so that she should feel sorry. <laughs> I really want to encourage other medical schools to include disabled students in their diversity. Um, there really isn't any reason why disabled students should not be allowed in the medical school. One of the things that's important to me is that other people have the same experience I did. If they've been through it and, you know, some traumatic injury like this, if I can show them, hey, I'm doing it too, then so can you. Do you wear glasses? How often do your eyes get tired after a 12, 16, or 18 hour shift? What if you were sensitive to fluorescent light and needed tint on your glasses at all times? These are all realities along the spectrum of vision impairment. We work around them every day, and medicine is especially fine-tuned to provide ways to function with vision impairment. Yet if we choose not to standardize our course documents, even something as simple as using a screen reader is not available to the abled and tired, much less to the blind. The miracles of hearing aids have made it possible for hundreds of thousands of people to function in the world. Sign language development has aided even more. Yet if we choose not to provide closed captioning on video learning opportunities, or to provide transcripts, or engage in voice-to-text dictation for virtual classrooms, we make it unnecessarily more difficult for students. Do you remember the Prozac wave of the 90s, or the lithium wave of the early 2000s? How about the popularity of mental health days among the overly busy and overworked? Mental health is necessary for fullness of life, and medicine is not lacking people who struggle with it. Depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, addiction, all of these impact our field and every professional field through the people who are called to the work. Students are not immune to these realities. Life happens, and mental health is a fragile balance. Though we cannot be variable in much of our requirements in higher education, we can develop relationships with our students such that we recognize the signs of declining mental health and offer resources. Then we have intellectual disabilities, otherwise known as learning disorders. This area of disability 
is often first observed in the halls of education. Learning disorders may be better understood as learning differences, as they most often apply to the mode and the medium of learning. For instance, a student with active ADD struggles in an interactive classroom but thrives in solitary learning. A student with a reading disorder like dyslexia needs more time to digest reading materials or can benefit from audio textbooks. Our legal system has begun to acknowledge that public institutions are mandated to be accessible to all people, within reason. That means that our written documents, syllabi, course information, and such, our presentations, our print documents, our videography, our audio production, any tool used to deliver information must have an accessible counterpart or be modified to be accessible. The goal is to ensure that all information available in public institutions, including institutions of higher education, is accessible to all who would choose to engage it. The meeting of legal requirements about access is termed compliance. We are legally mandated to comply with the law. More importantly, though, is that we have a higher mandate to educate, and to educate anyone who wants to be educated. Instructional design in regards to disabilities is not about political correctness or legal mandates. Rather, it is about making instruction as accessible to as many people who want to learn as possible. This can cause more work on the part of faculty, but the outcome may be that students of all abilities are more successful, more knowledgeable, and more prepared to enter their profession. That is the goal of higher education. That's the goal of instructional design. And that is the goal of excellent faculty. Take some time to read through the stories on your online course and familiarize yourself with the incredible dedication and determination of people who live with disabilities and yet find a way to work in areas of healthcare. We must develop a desire to ensure that these amazing people are able to learn what they choose to learn and be successful in whatever career they pursue. Need some help? Just let me know. Thank you for taking the time to listen and consider how instructional design can help us reach teaching excellence through accessibility. And thank you for continuing to offer your expertise to our students at Wilson School of Nursing.